you get a PMI loan and your first four or five years, you make your house payment. Remember we talked about there is a portion of equity for every house payment. So if you did nothing but continually make your house payment over time, eventually you're going to build equity as well. So in three, four, five years, you've got 20% equity in it. Then you would refinance and you would refinance out of the PMI requirement. Are we good? Do we understand that? Once you get this amount of money, PMI is supposed to come off. And you can get that amount of money by lowering the, va uh, lowering the loan or raising the value. Cool. That is very important to know because in the scenario of the FHA insured loan, in the FHA insured loan, it is a 97 or 96.5% loan. So the lender charges PMI, right? But now, starting October of, and I think it was 2018, FHA instituted a new rule that I believe is actually genius when you put some thought into it, but it sounds really bad. Any loan FHA insured since October of 2018, PMI will never come off, no matter how much equity you generate. All right? <clears throat> PMI will never come off an FHA loan no matter how much equity you generate. Is that a smart idea or a bad idea? At first, I thought it was a terrible idea. And then I started thinking about it and realized it's actually a genius plan by the FHA to help more people. Because watch this, if you've got PMI, or I'm sorry, yeah, if you've got PMI, but let's say you generate 20% worth of equity by making your house payment every month. That's gonna take you three, four, five years, somewhere around in that time frame, right? What does the FHA want you to do with that loan if the PMI never comes off? They want you to refinance it. Say it again. They refinance. want you to refinance it. They literally want you to refi because if you refinance that money, remember it's a sale with a repurchase. So FHA, the bank, gets their money back. And now they can reloan it and help another person. So the fact that you're feeling the pain of a monthly PMI payment when you should get it removed will force most everybody to refinance that loan into a conventional loan and pay that FHA insured loan off, which will now allow them to use that pool of money to help the next person down the line. You see what I'm getting at? Because the FHA, believe it or not, even the government has a limited pocketbook. It's just a way bigger one than ours, but it's limited. So the only way they can get their money back in to loan it out again is one of you guys under your FHA insured have to pay it off. Well, what's the point in paying it off if I'm not making you feel the pain in the form of 
a PMI monthly payment that you shouldn't probably have. So it was actually a genius idea by FHA to come up with because it forces people that once they get that 80%, they will refinance that loan into a conventional and now FHA can reloan the money, all right? So just keep that in mind. If your guy ever wants to buy FHA, he's gonna have PMI for life unless they refinance it at some point down the line in that third, fourth, or fifth year when they gain that much equity, okay? Now, FHA insured, so the bank still makes the loan, they can charge discount points, they can charge loan origination fees, they can charge PMI. The one thing they cannot charge is called a prepayment penalty. Now, I'm here to tell you right now, under the Dodd-Frank Act that came about in 2010, they're not allowed to charge, nobody charges prepayment penalties anymore on mortgages. I personally have a personal loan with Key Bank. It had a prepayment, but it was a five-year loan for the first 18 months. It's got a 5% penalty for prepayment. Now that's a personal loan, all right? But mortgages under the Dodd-Frank Act, nobody. But even prior to that, none of the government agencies can charge a prepayment. FHA can't, VA can't, USDA can't, SBA can't, none of those. And I know that that's probably a common question on the exam. None of the GSEs can charge a prepayment penalty. Now, FHA used to be assumable. They literally used to be what was called freely assumable. We could literally call your bank and go, hey, take your name off add Raymond's name to it and they would erase the name and write Raymond's and I would assume the loan. Remember the assumption? Contract stays the same as the parties change. Then that those all went away in 2016 because 1986 was the last year that those loans were written. Now HUD plays this, I mean FHA plays this game where well it could be assumable but you have to fully qualify well if you're going to fully qualify why don't you just go get a loan especially today the interest rates are way lower than they were five six seven ten years ago so while fha does say they're assumable it's not really practical to do it and you have to fully qualify which was the reason most people assumed someone else's loan anyway was just to not have to qualify or down payment or any of that. Now there on page uh, 241, we talked about HUD homes. This is where the HUD home comes from. If the bank loaned somebody money and FHA insured it, and that guy went to foreclosure, the bank went through the process of foreclosure, they went through the process of the sheriff sale, and then they remember they got their house under their arm. They walked in and they said, hey, you insured Raymond, i.e., that's why I said, think of it like a cosigner. We now want our money from FHA. So FHA gives the money to the bank to make them whole. And the bank goes, well, you might as well take the house since you paid for it. And then the FHA, which is a department of HUD puts the house on the market for sale and you get a HUD home. So that's where the HUD homes come from. And you know that when a you see a HUD home for sale, whoever that was before you was an FHA insured loan that went bankrupt or that went foreclosed on. Thumbs up. All right. The next one's the VA, the VA loan, the Veterans Association or Administration. Same thing here. They make no loans. The person goes to the VA and they get what's called a certificate of eligibility. 
a certificate of eligibility. And that is based upon their time in service, their grade, their rank, did they get honorably discharged? What years were they in? Was it during a war, a conflict? All of that. And when they get this certificate of eligibility, it will have a number like 100,000. This is a very basic overview, by the way. We're not gonna go real in depth. So a veteran gets an eligibility certificate for a number. The bank then loans that borrower the money, knowing that the VA has guaranteed that money in case that person files a foreclosure. Now, here's the, one of the key differences. The VA can actually loan any amount they want, or I'm sorry, misspoke, let me back up. The bank can actually loan any amount they want, but if they loan above the person's eligibility, then the bank is taking the risk at that amount of money. So typically, if the certificate says 100, the bank could loan 150, but if that guy goes into foreclosure, VA is only guaranteeing 100, the bank would lose 50. So typically the banks only loan whatever the certificate amount is, but they could loan more. Once again, because it is a very high loan to value, and it's like 100% for VA, the bank can still charge discount points, loan origination fees, things like that. Once again, no prepayment penalty because they're a GSE. Now here's the cool thing. VA loans can be assumed by another veteran, but here's the problem with the assumption, and this is why you don't see them a lot. The problem lies in assume, or let's think of it like this way. When I go to the VA and they say, you've got a C of E, uh, a COE, a certificate of eligibility for a hundred grand, and I buy a house for a hundred grand, think of it like my protection is on that house. So now if I let someone else assume that house, I in essence didn't get my protection back. So when I go to buy another house, I do not have the veterans guarantee. When I sell my house and put that money back in my piggy bank, now I can use that eligibility for my next house. So while they are assumable by other VAs, they typically do not because the guy selling the house wants to get his eligibility back. And the only way to do that is to put the money back in the piggy bank, i.e. sell the property. All right, I see a couple during the headlight look. So you say the person in order to get their veterans eligibility back must sell the property, not just uh, let somebody assume the responsibility. Right, because if, if I let you assume my loan and I walk away, mm -hmm. my certificate of eligibility is still on that house with you now. Right. So I don't and have it over here. The only way to put that money back into my piggy bank, so to speak, is I need to sell the house to you and then I get my eligibility back so I can go over here and buy another one. So, so I, here's a scenario. So I assume your property and then I don't make payments like I'm supposed to, home goes into foreclosure. Now. <laughs> you, because it's an assumption. That's right, because we called the bank and said, hey, Shauna is coming to take this over. That's right. right. Okay. You would okay. assume it. All right. So you, have, you now have the rights and responsibilities. So if you missed payments, they're coming after you. Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, here's something the VA does that is quite unique that I personally believe if everybody in the world would have done this, we may not have had the 2008 meltdown. Once that deal gets formed and just before it closes, 
the VA sends their guy out. Remember, the bank hired an appraisal because the bank's loaning the money. And the appraiser comes back in and says, yeah, that house is worth 100. So they go to close the deal. But right before they close, the VA sends their guy out too. And he is going to come back with what's called a certificate of reasonable value, a CRV. And what he's going to do is go back to the VA and go, yeah, that house is worth about a hundred grand. So the VA tells the bank, okay, go ahead, we'll do the deal. If the VA guy came back and said, dude, I don't know what they're looking at. That house is a vacant lot. It's not worth anything. The VA is going to go, stop. You can loan the money, but we are not guaranteeing that property because there's obviously an issue with it. Your guy said 100, our guy said zero. So there's a problem. So think of a CRV almost like a second set of eyes that go out and look at the house just to protect the VA because the bank had the appraiser. Now the VA has their guy too. So it's really hard to scam two appraisers. All of those issues about false appraisals that were going on and stuff like that and inflated appraisals in 2008 and 9 and 2010, that can happen if Bob's going out and Jim's going out and you got two different guys looking at it. It's hard to bribe two different people, all right? So the VA has this certificate of reasonable value that they then send their guy out and tell the VA, yeah, that's a good home, go ahead and do the deal.